Welcome to the Meg Quigley Summer Series. Today's webinar is the second of the Quiggle Talks. This time, it's a discussion of the careers that some of our amazing alumni have had, um, are having, <laughs> and is sponsored by Miller Marketing. Um, I'm Stephanie Patterson. I am the, Meg, uh, the MQVC Education Coordinator and also a former uh, Meg Quigley semifinalist. And the Meg Quigley Summer Series offers a once weekly free sessions throughout the summer featuring a variety of special topics relevant to our mission. Um, as a con continuation of MQVC's commitment to audience engagement and community involvement in the arts, the summer series serves bassoon students, avocational players, and professionals alike. If you missed any of the past webinars, you can find the videos on our website, mqvc.org, or through our social media channels. If you would like to support our continued efforts in these areas and beyond, please visit mqvc.org donate to become a friend of MQVC. So the sixth installment of the Meg Quigley Summer Series is a conversation with former semifinalists, affectionately known as Quiggles. They will discuss their unique career paths in music and career advice for aspiring young bassoonists. It is so inspirational to see these former competitors forge ahead into exciting and innovative careers in the arts, and I hope you will be as inspired as I am hearing their stories. It is now my pleasure to introduce our host for this panel, fellow Quiggle and MQVC team member, Jessica Finley Yang. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, actually, I wanted to say a little bit about Stephanie. She was in the very first group of Quiggles in 2005, and she's such a valuable part of MQVC now. And she's also the bassoon professor at the Schwab School of Music at Columbus State, and she's the principal bassoonist of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra. So she has a pretty amazing career herself. Um, and before we start, I'd like to thank the entire Meg Quigley team for organizing such an informative and amazing series. Um, and also to thank Dave Wells, who's behind the scenes today. He's a technological wizard, and he's been operating things behind the scenes for all the panels we've had so far. Um, if you have any questions um, for any of the panelists, please direct your attention to the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A. Um, and you can use that to ask questions of us and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, my name is Jessica Finley Yang, as Stephanie already said, and I'm currently the principal bassoonist of the Knoxville Symphony. And I'm also the bassoon teacher at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I was a two-time competitor in the competition in 2014 and 2016, and I volunteered my time to Meg Quigley because the partic participating in the competition really jump-started my ambition and drive to be a professional bassoonist today. And I want to help pass that opportunity on to the next generation of young, fantastic women bassoonists. And speaking of some young, fantastic women bassoonists, here today we have Amelia Del Cano, who was a semifinalist in 2019. We have Catherine Chen, who was a third place winner in 2014. And we have Kara Lamour, who was a semifinalist in 2012. And I'd like to start with Amelia. Could you please, um, this is for everyone, could you please introduce um, yourself to our audience and let us know how, you, how did you get started playing the bassoon and where did it take you? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, like Jessica said, I'm Amelia and I went to Meg Quigley in 2019. I was a semi-finalist. Um, I'm from Albany and I have two degrees in bassoon performance from the Eastman School of Music. And I just finished my first year as a bassoon fellow in the New World Symphony in Miami Beach, Florida. So uh, I am very excited to be where I am right now. And um, I actually started on clarinet when I was a young child and I switched to bassoon at age 12 because in my music class, we watched Fantasia. Uh, if any of you have seen that movie and there's the part with Mickey Mouse and the broomsticks and there's you know the famous bassoon solo and I loved it so much. I went home to my mom and said that I wanted to play the bassoon. And even though I really didn't know what it was, I just knew what it sounded like. And uh, that was the beginning of our love story. So, <laughs> very nice. Thank you, Amelia. Um, and let's hear from you. How did you get started playing the bassoon and, and where did it take you? Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Chen again. Um, I'm the principal bassoon of the Milwaukee Symphony and I did the Meg Quigley competition in 2014. I, I was the third place prize winner. I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, 
and I was always playing music since I was four years old uh, when I start, started playing the piano and then I played the cello as well. I didn't switch to bassoon until uh, when I went into high school at age 14, uh, the summer before entering high school, the band teacher told me that I look like a bassoon player. And I didn't know what he meant by that. I think he just needed bassoon players <laughs> in the band program. And so I immediately fell in love with it. Um, I was hooked and I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. So I, I knew at a very young age and um, I studied with Mark Goldberg at the Juilliard Pre-College in high school and then um, went to Curtis and studied with Daniel Matsukawa. And um, upon graduation, I won my first job as associate principal bassoon of the Toronto Symphony in 2015. And then in September of 2016, I won the principal bassoon position of the Milwaukee Symphony. And I've been living in Milwaukee for the last three and a half years. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, and a side note, Catherine and I were actually roommates. I don't know if, if you recall that yes, at the of course. <laughs> in 2014 at McQuigley, and she's been an inspiration to me as I continue my career in bassoon. And I'm so excited to talk with her today. So welcome, Catherine. Um, having me. Great to see you. <laughs> oh, good to see you too. <laughs> let's hear from uh, Kara. Hi, everybody. I'm Kara Lamore. And I guess I thought I was losing my mind, either that or I went to Quigley back in the dark ages, because I thought that I was called a Quiglet, but I'm delighted <laughs> to be joining the Quiggle panel today. I am from Texas, currently living in Houston, Texas, actually, but I grew up in North Texas, in Plano. Um, a lot of bassoonists know there's a veritable mafia of bassoonists who come out of Texas, and I'm one of the many. Um, and the way it generally works for all of us is that we start in sixth grade in a beginning band class. I was fortunate to have a bassoon and oboe class that I was able to do from sixth grade. Um, and Catherine, my mind is blown. My teacher also gave me that whole spiel about looking like a bassoonist. <laughs> but it did make me feel so special. Um, <laughs> I got really into youth orchestra and all of that. Um, my bachelor's uh, is from Eastman where I studied with John Hunt and then I did grad school at Northwestern where I studied with Chris Millard during my first year of grad school that's when I went to Quigley. Um, I had some I, I can get into this later but I had some interesting like victory lap years and gap years going on in my career um, and my career has ended up being wildly varied um, so it's involved um, some fellowship orchestra playing, Civic Orchestra of Chicago, um, a one-year position as um, associate principal of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, um, a full-time tenure track faculty position at the University of Missouri for two years, um, and now the general mix that I do, which I guess I can now finally be called a freelancer, most appropriately. I am a chamber music specialist I perform with a group that I founded uh, my sophomore year of Eastman, the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet. Um, and the thing that sucks up most of my time, uh, and I'm delighted, is uh, my wind quintet, which is called Wind Sync, um, among other freelance gigs. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, and speaking of a wide variety of career paths, um, we've all had super different starting points on the bassoon as i'm sure many of the, our listeners also you know had had kind of a similar story but we've all kind of taken a different path a different journey and i'm wondering um, maybe we can start with kara because you you kind of mentioned this how have your career goals changed from when you were a freshman in college or even a freshman in high school did you know that you wanted to be a professional bassoon player um and would your younger self be surprised by where you are now uh, I don't know that my younger self like knew what to expect, so maybe it, it, there just would have been excitement. Um, quickly to preface this, I ended up transferring high schools and colleges, and I think that like maybe like speaks to why the like jumping around career also ended up kind of suiting me. It's just like a pattern that's happened in my life. 
Um, but in high school, I definitely loved music and was definitely tossing around in my head ideas of being a composer, a conductor, maybe a bassoonist. Um, definitely had an interest in music as a career track. Um, freshman year of college um, was, was basically the year that I decided I would be a professional bassoonist. And it's probably worth mentioning that I started college um, as an undeclared major at Harvard. I took some good advice from some really special people, including musicians who I trusted, um, to try to diversify my education. And I'm really grateful I did it. Um, during that year, I, I had a lot of signs and um, a lot of feelings that pursuing performance right then was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, it's not for everyone. It's kind of crazy if I look back on it. Um, but that was the year. First, I wasn't sure. And then I knew for sure. Um, and that's been actually a really great like grounding or settling for me in terms of like knowing if this is the right career track for me. That's amazing. I had no idea that you started out at Harvard. Um, and I, I, I think I maybe have met a couple other musicians that have had a similar path that they've decided, you know, I, I'm going to do something practical, I'm going to do something, you know, more academic, and then once they get into college, realize, you know what, no, I really miss this, I love this, and I want to choose it as a career. Um, Catherine, did you have any kind of doubts about what you wanted to do when you were a freshman in high school? Um, well, like I said earlier, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, you know, at the start of high school. And um, I actually, I didn't mention this during the introduction, but I moved to the United States when I was six. So I wasn't always living in Taipei <laughs> um, and lived in Texas for a year. And um, then I moved to Connecticut. And so I grew up on the East Coast. So just for reference. Um, and I think the turning point was probably halfway through high school, uh, freshman year of high school, when I went to a New York Philharmonic concert. And um, I just was in awe of the whole experience, you know, walking into Lincoln Center and then going into Avery Fisher Hall and with the red carpets and chandeliers. Um, and then once you walk out into the audience, you hear the orchestra warming up and it was, like the most magnificent sight I had ever seen and heard. And that night they played Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. And I, I didn't hear it uh, prior to the concert. So then when the second movement starts and then the bassoons play, it was like the coolest thing I had ever heard. And I, that was kind of like the deciding factor. I was like, okay, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And um, so I guess I never um, like tried to do a different career per se, um, but I think my younger self probably would be surprised by the process in which it took to get to where I am today. Um, obviously, when you're 18 or 14, um, you don't know as much as you do now. And my younger self probably never would have thought how much hard work, discipline, and determination it, it took to, to get to a professional level. And I probably never would have thought that there would be a lot of times where I would fall down um, through trial and error. And you grow from those mistakes. And um, at the end of the day, you have to dig deep within yourself to find courage and strength to, to pick yourself back up and, and achieve your goals. That's so um, inspiring, Catherine. Thank you for that. I think a lot, a lot of um, young bassoonists and young musicians that go to conservatories um, have this kind of illusion that it's going to be easy. You know, like they're already good at their instruments, so what else do I need to do? I'm great. Um, <laughs> but right. to, to actually find the job and to, to go through all the audition processes, and it, it takes a toll. And I appreciate you being so honest and, and sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, Amelia, let's hear from you. Did, and I hope that 
we we've lost you for a second, but I'm glad you're back. Um, <laughs> I am wondering, yeah. Um, yeah, how um, how did you think that your career would go when you were a freshman in high school or even a freshman in college? What what was your idea of what it meant to be a bassoonist? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was having some like tech issues where like my internet was slow or whatever, but I'm back. So, no um, yeah. Um, I completely agree with what Catherine was saying. I was a big fish in a little pond, I would say. I was definitely not to like talk badly about my fellow bandmates in high school, but I was the only person that practiced and like went to lessons and um, I was in youth orchestra and I went to orchestra camp and um, it was because I really enjoyed it and I really, really loved it. And um, at that point I wasn't sure like, actually what I had to do in order to get an orchestra job. I just knew that I liked bassoon. And in all honesty, if I had known like how many hours I was going to spend doing reeds and long tones and stuff like that, I probably would have not continued. And that's, I think it's good that you like have a little bit of that like infatuation so that when you're deciding to commit to bassoon, you're in too deep. You know what I mean? So that's what it was like for me where I, I knew I wanted to go into music um, because of a, you know, experience I had at music camp where uh, we went to see the Philadelphia Orchestra. Actually, um, Mark Goldberg came and taught me a lesson and, you know, he told me one day that I was going to be a great bassoonist. So I've kind of been trying to prove him right ever since where I, I was just so inspired by the musicians of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I decided to go uh, major in bassoon at Eastman. And it, it was kind of like a wake up call in all honesty. I was surrounded by very, very talented musicians, the likes of which I had not really you know, met before. And that was inspiring to me. I wanted to be like them, you know, cause I was like 17 and I needed a role model, you know? And then eventually uh, I came into my own. So I would say that I've been chasing this dream of playing bassoon for a living, no matter what that looks like, you know what I mean? And then slowly over the course of my degree program, I realized more and more that orchestra specifically is what I wanted to do, uh, just because I admire the bassoon's role in the orchestra so much. I just, I think it's perfect for for me and my what I like and who I am. Um, so anyway, that's that's what I have to say on that. That's great. Thank you, Amelia. Yeah. Um, I think that probably all of us here have had a teacher or a mentor say to us, you know, you can do it. You you are great. You will be great. And I think that's such an important um, person to find in your own musical journey of like someone who really believes in you and is gonna like support you no matter what. And I'm so glad to hear that story from you, Amelia. I had a, same, a similar story. Um, and I remember being a freshman in college and my bassoon teacher at that time was Nate Zeisler. And he um, sat me down in his office, like probably the first semester and said, what do you wanna do with bassoon? And I said, oh, well, I think I wanna be in an orchestra. Like, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what it took. And he said, do you realize that that is extremely hard? And I said, well, I think so. And he said, no, do you realize how much work it will take and it was a wake-up call for me as a freshman like Amelia was saying I was pretty small a small pond big fish kind of thing in Kansas um, growing up in Wichita and um, we the, the mentors that we have um, in college really shape us and it's so great to know that you all had such amazing mentors that's really special um, now after you started college um, you all of you at some point we're in the Meg Closely Vivaldi competition. So I'm wondering, um, maybe we can start with Amelia on this one since you're the most recent competitor. How how did participating in um, Meg Quigley competition um, help you or change your, change your bassoon career, or change your path, anything like that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway for me was confidence because I had heard about Quigley for a while. Um, I went to school with Ivy Ringel, who was on the panel last week, and she was a year above me. And when I was a freshman, 
she won the Meg Quigley competition. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I could never do that. I could never memorize an entire Vivaldi concerto. Maybe someday, you know, it was like awe and inspiration surrounding the Meg Quigley like institution, you know? Um, and so I didn't audition the next time it came around, it was like 2016, I think, because I was still too scared. <laughs> I, I didn't think that I could do it. And then, um, you know, confidence builds up as you keep doing things, you know, so it was my second year of my master's degree. Um, I, I actually um, decided to audition then. And I was lucky enough, I didn't think I was going to make it to the semifinals, and I was lucky enough to make it to the semifinals. And that itself was everything to me, just to say that I'm a quiggle now. And doing the work, memorizing the concerto, like learning the new pieces. And then of course, getting to meet everybody in, it was at uh, Colburn, getting to meet everybody and be inspired by all the teachers and, you know, the master classes and all the people they have there. Um, and for me, that was like fuel to the fire where it was just like, I'm so inspired by so all these people, you know, and, um, you know, I just had such a great time in LA, you know, and um, now I know that I can do, do something like that. Yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, the, the purpose of Meg Quigley and why um, Nicolás Custer and Kristen Wolf Jensen founded this organization in the first place is to say, to, to give women in the art field an opportunity to say, yes, you are good enough. Yes, you, you do have the skills that it takes. And I'm so happy to hear you say that, Amelia. Um, <laughs> Kara, um, how, did, how did participating in the competition affect your life? Yeah, the thing that always stands out to me, maybe because it does circle back into my life, is that we all became friends, all the competitors. And I never did a sorority or anything, but I almost imagine that's what it would be like. <laughs> And it's so cool to show up at rehearsal and someone who was at the competition with me is like sitting there. I remember in particular playing some concerts with Julia Bear in Chicago, which was, you know, a few years after we had been at the competition together that already felt like a really great bond for, you know, section cohesion. And actually just yesterday or the day before I was exchanging um, books like pretty hard hitting like political philosophy stuff with Carly Gomez, who plays in Sinaloa now in Mexico. She was there with me um, and my roommate, actually, Jessica and Catherine, my roommate was Ananta Diaz. She's a Venezuelan bassoonist who lives in Europe. We were on the 2017 Orchestra of the Americas tour together. And yeah, just it's just wild. Like when we were roommates, we could barely communicate to each other. And I told her as I was leaving, I'm going to know Spanish the next time I see you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know pretty terrible, like botched pigeon esque Spanglish. And, and that's how I can communicate. But Ananta's English was a lot better. Um, five years later. Um, so now we're tight and, and keep in touch. It's just the coolest. Um, yeah. Just Oh, go ahead. That's amazing. I, and I, I think that's such a valuable part of the Meg Quigley family is that, you know, it, it's networking as much as it is a competition that we're meeting people in the field that are, have similar goals and, you know, um, making bonds and colleagues. And it's just so special. Um, thank you for sharing that. Catherine, um, what, what did you get out of being in Meg Quigley? What, what was something that like changed your life or, you know, um, affected the rest of your career? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, just to add on to what everybody else said, it was truly inspiring and empowering to be at the Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition. I met a lot of amazing female bassoonists, including you, Jessica. Um, and I mean, even meeting Kara and Amelia today, and we're all quiggles for life. And I think that's so special. Um, it's rare to be in a room full of all women. And it's even more rare to be in a room with women that also play the bassoon. So um, I made lasting friendships with my peers from this competition. And I, 
I will always remember during orientation dinner when we, you know, we're doing all these icebreaker things and um, they told us that we were quiggles for life. It's a community and although it's just for a few days, um, you know, that will forever stay with me for the rest of my life. And um, the competition I felt uh, empowered me and made me realize that women do belong in the bassoon world, the, the classical music world. And to see um, and hear recitals and master classes given by these strong female bassoonists in person, like Kristen Wolf Jensen and Nicolasa Custer, Ryan Crapo, it was also inspiring and um, I think that that hugely impacted my career as well. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. That's great. Um, I completely agree with everything everyone has said. Um, I was actually a two-time competitor, as I said last week, and um, I remember going to the first one that I went to in 2014, and Catherine Chen was my roommate, and I felt really like a fish out of water. Um, I felt sorry for all the fish analogies, but um, it 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 really opened my eyes to see how much more work I had to do because in my undergrad I was still kind of a big fish in a small pond. I didn't go to a traditional conservatory, I went to a state school and it really, um, yeah, it opened my eyes to how much more work I had to do. Um, and obviously I, I competed again, but it it really showed me where the level is, you know, like where, um, where people are at. And I think that's such a valuable experience for people who have high ambition to to see, to kind of gauge their position in, in the world they want to be in. So, um, and now to um, go to kind of a different topic, I was wondering, since we've all been in quarantine, um, kind of isolating ourselves for the past uh, four months, um, <laughs> I'm wondering what you all have been up to um, since orchestras and chamber music concerts are kind of um, not happening in the traditional way anymore. Um, maybe Catherine, if you'd like to start this one, um, what have you, what, what have you been changing about your routine or, um, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, for a little while I was managing, um, like the social media aspect for the Milwaukee Symphony and those were completely new, you know, tasks and things that I had never done before, you know, you go to school just to play the bassoon and learn music. And, and then, so now I feel like, um, having gone through quarantine and I mean, during this pandemic, um, I, I've learned a new set of skills and, um, I've gotten better at, um, you know, doing stuff online, virtually making music with, with a phone or, you know, with a camera, um, I have been working on pieces that I normally wouldn't have been able to learn because I didn't have the time. And um, I'm currently actually in the process of working on a website for myself and uh, it should launch in a couple of months. Um, and in this tough environment, you know, with things always changing on a daily basis, um, you can only control the things that you can control and so um you know i try to find the joy in the little things and although we can't play on stage um you know there are still ways to make music and um so yeah <laughs> Thank you. Have, you, have you made any kind of like video projects or what what have you been doing bassoon wise well, um, I've been kind of in the middle of making things like videos for reads, how to make reads or videos on certain excerpts. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it's it's in the still in the process of the gathering content and you sure. know, but um, it's definitely tested my patience <laughs> during this time. But you know. <laughs> Yep, we're, we're all in the same boat on that one. I um, have only made a few videos, but it takes so much longer than to just play it 
live, um, <laughs> especially if you're a perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Amelia, what what have you been up to? I know um, you're in New World, but they haven't had many concerts. Have they been producing some digital content? What have you been a part of recently? Oh, uh, New World has actually been doing um, this concert series called Live from Our Living Room, where um, the fellows that are still in Miami Beach get together and do like, you know, like a solo duet. Yeah, I don't think there's more than more people than a duet. And they just like do it from, you know, the apartment complex in Miami Beach. And, you know, that's been really nice to see uh, a community kind of sprout online for that. Um, since I haven't been in Miami Beach, I've been doing sort of my own thing. Um, I um, was accepted to NRO this summer. So NRO is actually doing some online stuff. Um, I'm playing in a master class with Roger and I in I think two weeks. Um, but in order to stay on top of it, you know, I, I found that, you know, there's so much going on in the world right now and motivation is definitely not constant. So I've had to kind of plan for that and like be ready for those days when I'm just like, oh, what's the point you know like everything is sort of like crazy and up in the air right now so um i've been going back to fundamentals and i've been actually keeping a practice journal um where i i like create a schedule for myself and i say okay like i'm gonna do this many minutes of long tones this many minutes of scales arpeggios um double tonguing flutter tonguing blah 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 technique and then i just like check it, check the list, you know, and having a routine that I do every single day really helps me because otherwise I feel like there's no structure, you know, and, and like right now we don't have that, you know, I, I mean, we're getting used to a brave new online world. Um, so that's sort of what I've been up to and I'm very much looking forward to playing in the NRO masterclass coming up. Very nice. Yeah. I also have been struggling with trying to figure out a routine and to be honest, I really haven't done much practicing at all um, <laughs> because I don't have any performances coming up and it, it just feels, um, yeah, it, it, I like to have a goal when I practice, but you are inspiring uh, a daily schedule that is true goals. So <laughs> I'm going to work on that, I think. Um, Kara, I know you've been um, doing a few things online and I actually um, noticed on Instagram the other day that you somehow managed to read through all 50 of the Bisonborn etudes. Um, <laughs> but you could tell us about that and then like whatever else you've been doing also. <laughs> yeah, I should say, yeah, I played through the whole Bisonborn book. Um, Iconic. <laughs> it did take 12 hours. I did take tons of breaks. I switched reads. I even like switched outfits. <laughs> um, I wanted to challenge myself to do it because this year is my 20th year playing bassoon. And I just thought that would be a really interesting project. It's the first etude book I started learning out of. I wanted to know how things have changed since 2000. <laughs> um, but actually, I was really inspired by all the feedback. Like, for all the problems with social media, people really are getting in touch. And I think that those interactions have a lot more value now that the pandem pan pandemic has hit and that that's kind of like our only social arena. Um, so the problems are still there, but I was just so excited to connect with people in that way. So next week, I'm going to start doing another uh, challenge for this is easier. I'm going to do playing through a symphony with a recording each day. Um, and I'll just post the calendar. If anyone wants to follow my calendar and learn some symphonies, you're welcome to do that with me. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, like all you guys, my practice has been really disrupted. Usually I'm extremely focused on like a pretty intense uh, rep list and, and I'm performing usually every weekend with my ensemble and and so that's just you know it, it's just all wiped and now there's a blank slate so the challenges are important to me um, as goals I'm also basically the administrator for my ensembles um, we get presented by concert presenters, but we are kind of our own admins. And so there's still a lot of work around that, especially with WinSync, we had to pivot to an online version of a festival that we present every April. And April was a really short timeline for us because we started 
our quarantine, um, like March 11th or something. Um, so yeah, we ended up creating, you know, virtual concerts from archival video and doing live stream sessions. And we created a, a music class for kids. We developed some kids content. Um, and so all that stuff was just, we were like kind of early on the curve and had to learn a lot and make some of the mistakes for folks uh, who now have followed and really learned how to do this stuff really well. That's awesome. That's so inspiring. I think I will follow along on your symphonic journey. Um, I'm sure that there's some symphonies that I haven't played and I don't know, Catherine, you are in a full time position, so you might have played all of them by now, but <laughs> um, that is so cool. Um, we did have a, a question in the Q&A um, that someone asked, um, how, at, at what age did we all win our first real quote unquote job? Um, and I can go first, I guess. Um, I, when I finished grad school, I was, what would that make me, 24? Um, and I won the second bassoon job in Chattanooga Symphony, but, um, and it's a real job, it's a, it's a contracted position, but it's a, it's a small job, it's, it's part-time, and um, I freelanced for um, a couple years, and I had a few other small jobs, and then um, I won the Knoxville second bassoon, which is also, you know, kind of part-time also, um, and it was only in January of this year that the principal bassoonist of Knoxville um, won a new job, and they asked me to move over to principal. So this is the first, uh, this is like month seven of being, um, like, gainfully employed only on, on bassoon, and I've, I, uh, yeah, I've done other, other jobs, but um, I, I think that and maybe some other people can chime in here, but I think that defining yourself by your job is not a great way to view yourself. Um, I I know that everyone here has amazing talent, and probably everyone in the comments and, and the participants are also amazing bassoon players, um, but you are more than your job. You're more than your title. You're, you're an amazing human. So um, with that, Amelia, what, what, um, what can you say about this? Um, yeah, I agree with that completely. Uh, you're more than a bassoonist, you know, there's like many different colors to your life and those colors are eventually what influences your bassoon playing. Um, anyway, I was uh, in on my undergrad when I took my first professional audition and a similar story to, uh, Quigley where I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And um, it ended up going really well. And then that gave me more inspiration to continue taking um, auditions. And I remember seeing you at the second bassoon audition in Knoxville, Jessica. Um, and so um, in my master's degree, I took a couple auditions, blah, blah, blah. And then a month after Quigley, so February 2019, I was 23. I had Did we lose Amelia? Can you guys hear her? The suspense is killing me. Ah! <laughs> maybe, maybe she'll come back. Um, oh, no. <laughs> uh oh, Dave says that we lost her. I, I'm sure she'll she'll log back on and we can come back to her. Um, Kara, can you um, talk a little bit about um, your first real job? I mean, you you already kind of mentioned that you've had so many different occupations. Um, oh, she's back. <laughs> it keeps kicking me off. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Did you did you hear everything that I said or no? Not quite. Not <laughs> when you were 23, something happened. Yes, when I was 23, I got I auditioned for New World, and um, so we just I just finished my first year there. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Okay, Kara. Yeah, I I might be the oldest person present. I'm 32. Um, I had my one year position in New Zealand when I was 25 and got my faculty position when I was 26. Um, interestingly, I actually think that was too young for me. So um, a career, like if we're all so lucky, it's on a long trajectory. So we can keep the long game in mind. And I also just wanted to say, because it speaks to what everyone's saying so far, 
Um, when I was teaching at Mizzou, I inherited some career courses from a predecessor, Jonathan Kuskuski, who now teaches at the Excel program in Michigan. And I learned a lot from just being forced to teach his curriculum in his wake. And the thing that I love thinking about most from that is the concept of a portfolio career. Just the idea that basically any musician um, is going to have many different facets to their careers. And even thinking of a job job, you know, principal of the New York Phil or something, um, that's just one piece to that person's uh, career. Yeah, I completely agree. Thank you for that. Catherine, um, if you could answer the question at hand, um, what age did you get your first job? And if you want to respond to what we've been talking about already. Sure. Um... I'm currently 27 years old. I won um, Principal of Harrisburg my, senior, my last year at Curtis. Um, I think I was 22. And um, at the end of that school year, I won Toronto. And, um, and then I won Milwaukee at age 24. And um, I do agree that you know, your job doesn't define you and um, you go through so many experiences in life and that's just one thing that happens to you. And um, I know that a lot of people define success and e it equals happiness, but it doesn't. And, um, you know, if you want if you use that as a way to find happiness, it only just moves the goalpost even further, in my opinion. And um, I, I think that, you know, um, sorry, I'm getting emails, but oh, that's okay. Um, I mean, we all go through um, applying for things, applying for schools, auditions, and we all face rejection at one, some one point or another and it doesn't define you and um, I hope it doesn't let it define you. It is difficult to overcome at that moment and um, in that moment it feels you know so hard but it will pass and just let it be a learning experience. Use it as a marker and let that be motivation to help get to your eventual end goal. That's such good advice. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we had another question in the Q&A um, from a 16-year-old bassoonist who says, um, how do you overcome feelings of not being good enough? I think you just answered that perfectly, Catherine. Um, that, and, and maybe I can add a little bit that um, as bassoonists um, and as musicians, we play the bassoon because we love music. And I think first and foremost, um, any feelings that you have about the bassoon and about music should be love. Um, and if you love what you're doing, um, it shouldn't matter what other people are doing. Comparing yourself to other people, um, that doesn't as matter as much as how much you love the bassoon solo in the end of the second movement of Tchaikovsky 4, or, you know, the, the Saint-Saëns bassoon sonata. Those two pieces are some of my absolute favorite pieces of music and whenever I'm feeling sad about an audition I didn't win or a job that I didn't get or someone who beat me in an audition, um, I always come back to the beautiful music that we are so privileged to get to play. Um, and I hope that um, that answers that question. I, I think that, um, you know, it, it's a hard world that we're in and um, the, the love of music really sustains me. Um, I'm getting a lot of nods, so I, I, I think this is a shared sentiment, so. Um, okay, and I did have one other um, question I, I had planned to ask, and then we've got another cue from um, Pearson. Shout out to Pearson. Hey. Um, but um, I, the, the question I had was, um, if someone who's listening, like perhaps a 16-year-old bassoonist, um, wants to have the career that each of you have, um, they have a goal to be um, a professional bassoon player. Um, what advice could you give them? What steps should they be taking? Um, and what challenges 
might they expect to face and for that matter you know the future of classical music what is happening with covid it's kind of we see it maybe as a threat to the way that we've always done things um if you could provide some inspiration or just general thoughts you've been having that would be great um maybe maybe from amelia yeah um you know these kinds of things have been going around in my head a lot as well and my answer to that would be if there's a will, there's a way. Um, you know, when I was a young bassoonist, like 16, 17, I had a thought that one day I would just magically be good. I would just wake up one day and I would just win every audition and I would just be amazing. And it's really, it really took me a while to figure that out, but it's really not like that. It's more like putting your head down and just doing the work because you enjoy the work, not because the work will get you to some somewhere where you'll be happy. It's more about the journey. So I did a lot of going to the gym. And by that, I mean, not going to parties in college, going to the practice room at 845 on a Friday night, doing long tones, scales, arpeggios, etudes, recording myself, going to concerts, listening to recordings, blah, 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 blah. Like, and that was inspiring enough to me, you know, just because I knew that I was doing the work. And it wasn't like I was expecting something in return. You know, it's, it's not, delayed gratification is the name of the game, unfortunately. I, I think we can all be blunt about that, you know. Um, that's just the reality of the playing the bassoon, and it's a life journey, you know, if you want that. I think that you need to decide for yourself if this is what you want to do. And if it is, don't expect to just suddenly like get to where you want to be and just be happy suddenly. It's a lifelong journey. I know I keep saying that, but like think of the long run, essentially. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. That's so true. Thank you, Amelia. I, I completely agree. Um, I remember my freshman year of college, my Nate Zeisler, my, my wonderful bassoon teacher, drew um, a graph for me of uh, the, the graph of success. And most people think that the graph is a straight line going up, but it's actually like takes twists and turns and it goes down and backwards. And then finally, you know, it, you, you get to a place where you um, want to land. And it, it's a journey completely. And you have to love the journey. That's the whole point. <laughs> um, Catherine, can you speak to this question? What advice could you give to a young person um, who wants to do what you do? Sure. Um, well, there's a saying that I really like, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And um, I think it's really true. If you want to be great, focus on those people that are supportive and passionate in your interests, because it will take every ounce of your energy and you'll need the support of others to get to where you want to be. Um, but that being said, if you want to be the best, you have to collaborate and compete with the best. So the more exposure you can have to festivals, symposiums, like my Quigley competitions and additional educational events, the better you'll ultimately become. And um, you'll be able to build a strong network through all of these things. And, and then you'll also find that the music world is kind of small and you may end up crossing paths with them further down the line like mm -hmm. seeing Jessica today <laughs> when even though we were roommates back in 2014 um but I, mm -hmm. I mean the most important thing is to work hard you can't do mm -hmm. anything without putting in the work and always strive to be excellent and um to kind of also answer the kind of what to do in this environment. Um, I think that classical music will come back. When you look at the news, the number of cases going up may look bleak and things are always changing. But I think um, due to the pandemic, there will be, and I mean, there has been structural changes on on how arts organizations run and manage i mean they have to um in, in this environment that we're in today outside of music everyone has had to adapt 
we've all had to adapt to a different way of life. And humans are adaptable and resilient to look at it more positively while we can no longer go about our normal course of business, playing on stage and making music, there has been an incredible amount of creativity and music made. And I think humans need the arts now more than ever. And um, what you can only do for yourself is control what you can control, like I said earlier. So I'd, my advice to a young bassoonist is practice and be the person that eventually comes back after this better and stronger. And when opportunity returns, you'll be prepared in shape and more competent than anyone remembers previously. Very inspiring. Thank you, Catherine. That's a call to action for everyone here. Get to the practice room. <laughs> um, Kara, let's, let's finish with you. Um, so if someone wants to have a similar career to your, which is a little different from, um, I guess, the three of, um, of us that are kind of an orchestral bassoon paths, that you have this amazing, very beautiful career, what would you say to someone, or maybe to your former self in high school, like, or, or to, to someone that looks up to you, how, how do they get where you are? Um, I think that, you know, the the best thing to do is to do what you want, which can be harder to do than you think. Um, basically, I've learned through time that it's been my projects that have built themselves up and created something I could actually stand on. And a little project just begins as an idea. Um, if you have an idea, and maybe it's like, somewhat outside the typical bassoon discipline. If your idea isn't just practicing excerpts, I actually think that it's still worthwhile because it contributes that other angle and potentially it makes you the more marketable orchestral player too, um, if that ends up being your path. Um, so that's what I would say if you're interested in, in doing something like chamber music and a project-based career. Um, I love what Catherine was saying about this moment and something that I think is special about this moment is that the playing field is level, like straight up, like there are no gigs. <clears throat> so everybody's an amateur musician now. Everybody. Yo-Yo Ma is an amateur musician. Um, let's take advantage of this fact that we're all in the same boat and let's like get together and collaborate and let's pass around our ideas and let's validate um, all the ideas that we're seeing. Um, I've seen some really incredible at home, truly amateur performances that inspired me just as much as, you know, the equally incredible songs of comfort that Yo-Yo Ma is doing. Um, and so that's what I think is really special about this moment as it relates to a career. Thank you. Yes, I completely agree. There have been some really incredible performances online, many from actually former Quiggles. Um, if you want to check out some um, performances on our Facebook page of different Quiggles um, doing amazing things. And during this time of isolation, we can still find ways to make music together. Um, we do have one question that kind of is, um, you know, somewhat related. We were talking about um, just now, Kara was mentioning um, you know, how amateur musicians have the, the opportunity to, you know, play out and, and be heard and um, I, there's like less refinement that's required because we're not in a fancy concert hall with our tuxedos on. Um, and I think that the question Pearson asked, um, there's this school of thought that claims sound doesn't matter, all that matters is playing in tune and in time. After sitting on the other side of audition screens and performing in orchestras, do you agree with this statement? So I think it, it's kind of like a dichotomy between like perfection and beauty um, is kind of the two worlds that we're trying to inhabit at the same time as classical musicians. Um, I've only been on one audition panel and it was for timpani. Um, and I thought that it was gonna be really uninteresting and like, what's the difference? They're all playing on the same drums, but I actually could tell um, who was the winner. Um, I was surprised by myself, um, but I 
I think that what maybe we can have have a little discussion of this, but um, what I found most compelling was actually not, I mean, in percussion, it's not about tone, but um, the musicianship. Uh, it wasn't really the rhythm. It wasn't really, you know, playing what's on the page, but um, how much you could tell someone loved playing the timpani excerpts. <laughs> um, so, um, Catherine, maybe, I don't know if you've sat on any audition panels in, in Milwaukee. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, I haven't officially sat on on, on audition, audition committee yet. Um, uh, in our CBA, they allow us to, anybody, to watch the finals. So I've sat in on, for instance, like the concertmaster audition, and we had harp, um, we had tuba recently, and some string players. And um, to answer Pearson's question, I do think sound is important because it is the first thing that you hear and your sound is your voice and it's your vehicle for expression. I think having a great sound is desirable, um, but sound isn't the only thing. Obviously you, you need everything. Um, I think the most important thing is to be a great musician. Uh, being able to play in time and in tune are givens. Um, those are like things that you just have to be able to check off the box. And um, that's just something that people behind the screen expect. And um, in an audition setting, I think the most important thing is to really showcase the best qualities within yourself and set yourself apart. And, you know, that means being expressive, show different colors, and have a variety of um, colors and profile and depths into your your sound and your musicality, your phrasing. And um, I mean, once you're in the job and you're playing all of the music every week, you have to be versatile too. You have to do anything that a conductor or the person on the podium asks of you. And um, that's really important. And uh, I stress so much that chamber music is uh, really important, especially um, if you can, while you're in school, play with as many uh, you know, of your peers as you can. Just form chamber groups and read music together and learn about how to be able to play with somebody else and understand the other instrument's tendencies and be able to blend with that color. And um, I think, you know, if you're versatile, then you'll be more sought after and um, that will, you know, help you thousands afterward. Such great advice. Thank you, Catherine. That is spot on. I think being an orchestral player is you have to be so versatile and you have to be so sensitive and it's it's more than just sound and rhythm and pitch like you were saying. Um, we are about out of time. If Kara and Amelia would like to talk about this question, you're welcome to. Um, Kara, do you have any additional thoughts? Uh well, I'll just echo what Catherine just said, that um, my playing has improved so much since I started playing in a professional wind quintet, and actually my performance at auditions, too. Um, it's, it, yeah, great training. Recommend it. Definitely. Yeah, I think um, chamber music is really, it, it, it makes you way more vulnerable, and it, in some ways I find the playing in chamber music, I'm in the Knoxville Symphony Woodwind Quintet, and it's made me um, more sure of myself. Like, I, I know how to be a musician. I think when we get into excerpts, you kind of maybe get in your head sometimes about how exactly it should go, but um, playing chamber music really allows you to um, make decisions that are really meaningful to the music, and then you can apply that to excerpts that might have a little bit more emotional baggage, like Bolero. <laughs> so, um, Thank you um, to all of these amazing panelists. 
And thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, I know there's a lot of content happening, like we've been saying, there's a lot of content on the internet and thanks for being here tonight and choosing us. Um, and I also wanted to thank one more time Miller Marketing, um, who gen generously sponsored this week's panel and our panelists' appearance. Um, we hope you'll tune in next week to the seventh installment of Meg Quigley Summer Series featuring Ben Coelho, who is the professor at the University of Iowa. He'll be discussing the three etudes by Jose Siquiera, which is a piece on the Meg Quigley rep list this year, and um, Nicole DeMaio, who is also a composer of one of the pieces for uh, her piece is called Solo for Bassoon Alone. And we're also looking forward in the coming weeks, we've got um, Natalie Moeller, Renina, Rena S. Mile, and Adolphus Hale Sork, three other amazing composers who are also composers of this year's repertoire. And um, joining Adolphus Hale Sork will be LaColian Washington, who um, has the, as far as I can tell, the only recording of Hale Sork's bassoon set. So um, if you're entering the competition or want to know more about that piece, um, it's amazing. I have been working on it myself. Um, be sure to tune in, and you can find information for all of that stuff on our website at mqvc.org or on our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, thank you again so much for being here, everyone, and we'll see you next week.